Hello and welcome to this very special programme created to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Disney's The Lion King in London. Millions of theatre goers have experienced this award winning musical and now you're going to get the opportunity to go behind the scenes of this unique production. You're going to find out how the classic animated film was adapted for theatre, how the visionary director Julie Taymor and her entire creative team met the challenge of recreating a huge number of exotic animals and vast African landscapes for one stage, and how the team here at the Lyceum Theatre keep this show running year after year and looking as spectacular as it did on opening night. This is The Lion King Behind the Scenes. Think about an animated movie. This one is about 74 minutes long. That's less than the first act of the stage show. Remember the scene where Mufasa is walking and little Simba's walking, and his little tiny foot goes in the big footprint of his father. That one image of the little foot in the big footprint tells us everything about father, son, a young boy hoping to one day fill his father's shoes. Well, how would you do that on stage? Adapting it to the stage meant expanding the story. There were lots of challenges in putting Lion King together, but certainly the biggest one was for the audience to accept that the people they're seeing on stage are representing animals. Facing the almost impossible task of translating the hit film to the stage, the show's producers knew that it would require a truly unique and inspiring vision. There's a rule in, in Hollywood that you, all you need is one really great idea. And I had one really great idea, and that was Julie Taymor. In approaching her first Broadway musical, Julie Taymor had the idea of using an eclectic range of theatrical techniques to retell the story of The Lion King. Known for her innovative work as both a director and a designer, Julie did not simply put the film on stage. She created a theatrical language to tell the story as it had never been told before. The fun part for me was how do you do a stampede on stage? How do you create the image of the savannah? Because the animated film could do it all. They could, they could create those vast landscapes and the cave of Scar. I love doing that in the theater, finding highly theatrical means to create uh, a naturalistic landscape. I don't need all that fur. I don't need literal paws. Maybe it's just a tail. You know, just the mask and a tail. And then let the actor suggest it, like the movement of the shoulders moving forward. You get the strength. He doesn't have to be on all fours doing that. Think about Simba. We use shadow puppets, rod puppets, hand puppets, and two human actors to play one character in the show. The story, the animal kingdom, the uh, music, all the inspiration for the masks and puppets comes from Africa and musically South Africa. In the movie, of course, it's beautiful to look at. It's exquisitely animated and the designs are gorgeous. But what you also have are those fantastic songs by Elton John and Tim Rice and that beautiful underscore by Hans Zimmer and the fantastic song choral African material that Lebo M and Mark Mancina shaped. On the stage, we expand all that music. This combination of European Western pop music coming from Elton John mixing with Lebo M's South African tradition and his own composing style. This is something original and, and fresh and different. After the movie The Lion King was done, we made a record album called Rhythm of the Pride Lands. And it was songs inspired by The Lion King or taking themes, musical themes of The Lion King and expanding them out and giving them lyrics. That really gave it something that no one had ever heard before. Without that music, there probably is in no essence of, of The Lion King. In addition to providing the setting for The Lion King and some of the show's musical soundtrack, the influences of African culture and language can be seen, heard and felt throughout the production. Five different African languages are sung in the show, and each production of The Lion King around the world includes singers from South Africa. In addition to giving the show its unique and authentic sound, these performers and their spirits truly embody the heart and soul of The Lion King. Mm. 
As well as telling the story and reflecting its rich African origins, the creators of The Lion King used different physical elements of the production to help emphasize the important themes of the story. The circle of life is in the designs all through the show. At the beginning of Act Two, there's a circular water hole. Mufasa's mask, it's a circle. When we push the gazelles across the stage on this contraption, you see wheels turning, circles. Throughout The Lion King, which is about the circle of life, we see circles everywhere in the show. At the very base of The Lion King is a fundamental story about responsibility. When we made the movie and when we made the stage show, we talked about this a great deal. The whole thing is actually about Simba facing his responsibilities. The most important theme is about truly believing in who you are and what you can be and aspiring to do your best. And I think what Simba has to go through in order to achieve what he's meant to be with his, which is his rightful place as king, he has to go through quite a journey. He believes the wrong people. He follows the wrong advice of his evil uncle Scar. It's only when he reflects on all of this later as a young man that he realizes how to put things right. The story is a classic prodigal son story. The young prince has to go out on a journey into darkness and find himself before he's allowed to come home and take on the mantle of kingship. And it's a story about community. And that's what The Lion King is a representation of. It's all of these different fractions of the, of the savannah coming together to pay their respects to the future king. And that's what's great about any society. We might not all get along, but when things are really important, we all are bound together by any sense of community. It's a tale that every culture, every, everybody understands, but how it's told is very original. Children and adults alike suspend their disbelief, knowing that it is theater, that we're not really in a savanna, that we're not really in a jungle, and they go with you. And their eyes focus after a while on just the character. When they look at what's behind me right now, and they don't see a circular staircase, but they see a rock. When they see people with grass growing out of their head and say, it's the savanna. When they see a man with a fantastic mask over his head, and they say, oh, he's a lion. Then the audience is on the journey with the theater maker, and that's the best kind of theater. The journey of The Lion King takes us to a number of locations, from the African savanna to the jungle. These scenic challenges led the show's creators to employ a number of different theatrical techniques to create The Lion King's world on stage. It's a very relatively simple set, but actually it's an ingenious set in that it's able to create several different environments. You get a great sense that it's not just this tiny box you're looking at, it's a, the vastness of, of the, the great African uh, jungle and the savanna. I talked to Richard Hudson, the set designer, and I said the whole point of, of theater is it's for the audience to fill in the blanks. You give them a little bit and they see more. If you look behind me right now, you see the cyclorama, which is the back wall, that we can light and it looks like infinite space. And also look that the floor is tilted, or we call raked. So the floor raking up, going into that big expanse at the back, the cyclorama, creates a sense of almost infinite space for you, as if it goes on and on and on. And then Pride Rock, we knew we needed Pride Rock, it's a major symbol from the opening of the, of the movie, and that's where the, where the lions live. Although its effect from an audience perspective is very simple with this set sort of corkscrewing out of, out of the stage, um, the machinery and the mechanics and the engineering and particularly a lot of the computer side of things is highly complex. What we built is essentially a circular staircase and it rises um, right out of the stage floor and, and descends into the stage so that it can appear for different scenes. If you look at the rock, it's as if a lion has actually scratched onto a tree and indented it with their claws. And that claw pattern appears in a number of places around the show. So it's, you're constantly reminded it's a show about lions, but also a show in which lions have dominated the entire territory. With The Lion King having to recreate so many different environments, the show's creator's new lighting would play a huge part in realizing the story on stage. A challenge not just creatively, but one that would put huge pressure on the technical production team behind the show. Lighting changes your emotional experience. Um, just the color of something and changing quickly can alter how you feel. It can make something very energetic if the lights change quickly. If the lights are rising slowly, it can be very calming. Lighting has a huge storytelling ability. We have 
one lighting desk which, which operates more what we would call the conventional lighting and one lighting desk which operates our moving lights. In terms of individual light sources, it would be well in excess of a thousand. The importance of lighting in The Lion King is never more evident than in the show's opening sequence, Circle of Life. We start off with a sort of a misty, rather darker background. We fill the stage with smoke to create that early morning effect. And then in sequence, the clouds lift, and as they're lifting, the sun is rising, and with that, the lighting adapts. The audience actually sees these, these battens with the silk rising, and the sheer movement makes it shimmer. So we go, oh my God, it's like the sun over the desert. That is the absolute essence of the power of theater, which is that you animate an inanimate object and you bring life into it. When you take the scenery and the lighting and the costumes and you put them all together in the circle of life, all those elements can be all pulled apart and thought about, but it's the impression they all make together. In addition to the innovative theatrical techniques that have made The Lion King such a success, it's the realization on stage of the characters that people know and love from the film that ensures that this universal story continues to connect with people around the world. He is a diverse character. That's what Simba is. He's just a restless wanderer. He's just wandering around, jumping around, trying to find a better place because he's traveling through the jungle with Timon and Pumbaa. So he's putting on this front of, you know, I'm energetic, I'm young, I'm just going to have fun with you guys. But at the same time, he's got a lot of emotional baggage. It's not until Simba's able to open himself to what his father taught him all those years ago that he's able to complete his journey into manhood and into becoming the king he's meant to be. When Nala shows up in the picture, that's when he has to really face the fact that, you know, things happened in his past that he really, really needs to confront. I like to describe Nala as the king. She is the king. She has to take over the role of king because Scar can't do it. She sees what happens to all of the Pride Lands and what it's going to be under the, the dictatorship of Scar. At that moment, at 10 years old, she needs to grow up and she needs to be the person that's going to speak up for her people. She thinks Simba is dead and then Scar decides that she should be his queen and so she feels she must flee and leave. Nothing she's doing is negative, especially at the end of Shadowlands. She's saying the words, Giza Buyabo, which means, I will return. Nala is a strong woman. And she's the one who comes in with the power and the strength and the heart and conviction to take care of her people. Mufasa is quite um, intricate in a way that he's his father, he's king, he's a husband, and how he balances all of that into this one character. Mufasa is very important to me because of what he represents. He's a good leader who is cut down in his prime, and that's something we're all afraid of, that we'll have good leaders who won't be there to guide us. He is a, a nurturer, a caring man, he is a teacher, and he is the essence of a king. He rules with quite a tender heart really, even though he's got this demeanor of very, being very powerful and very aggressive at times. He's into his, uh, the whole tradition, the ancestry thing, um, you know, the whole circle of life. He's an extremely spiritual character. Scar is the uh, brother of Mufasa, the younger brother of Mufasa. He's second in line to the throne um, and actually can't understand why he's not uh, king. When Simba's born, uh, he suddenly becomes third in line to the throne, and <laughs> this uh, really upsets him. It builds such resentment in how he feels towards his brother that he becomes the, the opposite of what his brother is. He takes all of this energy and uses it um, in, in bad ways. He plots his way to, to see how he can become king. And of course, the best way for the third in line to become first in line is to get rid of the first and second. Scar's character, I mean, I, I suppose it's the greed and ambition and the uh, inability to join the circle of life. The first character that we meet in the show is Rafiki, 
And uh, the first sound you'll hear is this cry across the savanna announcing that the, the king is born. When I compare the characters between the film and the stage show, Rafiki is the one who emerges most because we get so much more time with Rafiki. There was always this, this problem, really, because the first song in The Lion King is the circle of life, and in the movie, it's a female voice. So this made sense because now we had Rafiki being the person who would sing that. She really became an important person in expanding and bringing something major to this, to this piece that's not in the animated cartoon. He's a very funny character, but he does not have the spirituality that the Rafiki now has. She is in South African terms what's called a Sangoma, and a Sangoma is able to in, interpret uh, things from the past and is able to see the future and is able to heal and is able to, to guide spiritually for the community. In the community, they're the ones who help people to realize that the, even when someone died in the family, you don't forget about the person. You always remember that person. You can ask things, and we believe that they, they will help us back. I love Rafiki because she has a crazy wisdom. We don't always understand why she's telling us what she's telling us, but it does add up. She helps Simba realize his role in the Pride Rock. She's the one that really opens his eyes as to what he needs to do to become the man he's meant to be. By having the South African actresses play Rafiki, we get a much richer cultural view of the African element coming into the show, and we get a sense of, of their culture, and we hear their language. Not only was, was a great role created for a woman, but a woman that's both spiritual, soulful, and humorous. She needs to be there, and she needs to be this spiritual woman this Sangoma, the real Sangoma. Well, he's friend and mentor to the king and to Simba. And, you know, he was there for Mufasa when he was a kid and has sort of remained his trusted friend throughout. He's the one who's able to give him advice on his son and on how to handle situations that no one else can do. And then he's subsequently looking after Simba and, uh, uh, and trying to pass on the Whatever, whatever he can pass on to Simba. He can make the king laugh, he can, you know, give the king great insight, and yet he's this tiny little bird. I think he has ideas above his station, but he's, um, you know, he wants to be the advisor, but he's sort of thrown into the role of childminder a little bit. Timon and Pumba, they just love each other. They met a couple of misfits and just liked each other immediately. Timon's a bit of an opportunist. Um, he, he, he got a double whammy. He not only befriended a big warthog, who was uh, quite good and protective, he befriended a lion. I think that Timon and Pumba come into Simba's life at the perfect moment. He's lost his father, he's lost his home, and he's run and run and run until he's exhausted. Pumba's so loyal to his friends. Loyalty is very important to him. And I think that's the only time that he ever does get a little bit aggressive in defense of his friends. Timon thinks he's... Uh, the brightest guy in the jungle, but in fact, he wouldn't be much good on his own. It's Pumba and Simba that have helped him to become the character he is in Lion King. They've turned their backs on their responsibilities. They're just out for themselves. And in watching Simba, they realize they can be part of something too. Of course, no character is complete without their costume. And the level of research and design that went into creating the look of the characters is simply staggering. The costumes, and when you look at what Julie designed, have a fundamental idea at play, which is to use natural materials, or to appear like we're using natural materials, to represent the earth and the planet and the savanna itself, but also to use patterns of fabric, like the kinte cloth that Zazu's costume is made of, that would be immediately African. 99% of the, of the costumes, they start off as, as, as white fabric, um, so everything is dyed, or screen printed, or painted, or digitally printed, and that's an enormous job. I take my inspiration as a costume and mask and puppet designer from everywhere. For instance, Bufasa's costume, when you look at the picture, this whole, this whole collar piece is really Balinese. This is very Maasai. The bottom is very Indonesian. Julie spent a lot of time researching all of those sort of elements of tribal design and tribal clothing in Africa. It was a wonderful cohesive quality. All of the costumes feel like they're from the same group. It's so rare to have costumes that transcend just being costumes that become scenery and become architectural elements on stage. Ta, ta, ta. Ta, ta, ta. 
drawing together a range of styles and influences, many of which are taken from the African cultures that feature so heavily in the show. Every costume in The Lion King is truly unique. This is a dancing lioness costume that used in the, the lioness hunt, and it's a um, fully beaded corset. Just turn around a little bit, patience, and see if you put your arm up. And we've taken attention to detail all the way around with all the beads changing colour, gently, gradually. There are no sparkles or sequins or anything like that in the show. It's all a matte finish, which gives it that sort of look as if it's in the African savannah, like this sort of sun-baked look. This is one of the grassland costumes used in, uh, in Act One. Um, there's about 24 of them on all together to create the feeling of the savanna when Mufasa and Simba are out hunting. There's a steel hoop to hold out the grass at the bottom. It's important that they look cohesive as a group. If they were all to sort of be sort of individual, then the, the, the effect would be lost. And then a lovely little grass corset made of artificial leaves. From the skin colour of the, the performer, moving down to be lighter as it approaches the grass and then going up to the grass at the top. The board is incidentally made of the same sort of stuff that they make airplane wings out of so that it's supremely light. It's really, really light. You'd be amazed at how light this is. From the auditorium, one thing the audience might not realise is the attention to detail in all the costumes. Whether principal costumes or ensemble, individual beads are hand sewn on and the majority of the costumes are hand painted and printed to ensure they look perfect. If you can imagine any, any aspect of you or any, anyone's clothing being worn eight times a week for 52 weeks of the year, how quickly it would wear out, you know. So they, uh, they have to take care of everything really carefully, uh, carefully, really carefully hand wash most things, make sure that all everything's shiny and new as it should be on day one. An example of this level of care and attention is that every single cast member's shoes are hand painted to match their exact skin tone and adjusted and repainted if the cast comes back from holiday with a suntan. We had a number of ideas at play when Julie was designing the costumes. We tried different things and did, did actually a laboratory, if you will, for a number of characters. And as we played with each of these techniques and looked at them, the ones that were the most exciting are the versions that you see in the show today. With the look of each of the characters being so familiar to those who've seen the animated film, the show's director, Julie Taymor, employed not only elaborate costumes, but also masks and puppets to turn the human actors into animal characters. I took the Lion King images, the, the, the looks of the characters in the movie, and I fed them through my own, my own aesthetic and my own ability or my own style and came out with, an, with another one. With each animal, I had to find the exact technique that would be best serving that character. We've probably got it in excess of 300 puppets. Ranging from the enormously expensive, complicated scar puppet, all the way down to a tiny little single hand-operated shadow puppet. The challenge is that the dancers and actors have to be game and enthusiastic to embrace that they're going to have these other appendages and that they're going to have limitations and they'll be very challenged. And when we audition, we always look when, when people are auditioning with these puppets to see if they get, have joy or if they're going to be overwhelmed. With the puppets being such an integral part of the show, it's essential that both their design and maintenance ensure the actors are able to incorporate them into their performance. This is one of our main jobs here, to make sure that we keep all the masks and puppets as light, as light as possible. The prongs here are made out of balsa wood, which is also very light wood. We use acrylic paints and uh, several layers to make sure that it looks in the end like wood. Well, the, these come over from the States as this, and this is, the, uh, this is just the raw carbon fiber mask. And what we do with this, we, uh, we go through it, repair any breaks, there's a bit of a crack there. So we have all the raw materials in our workshop. And um, then we do a base coat, coat. And then once the base coat's on, we can then go into all the details, like the, uh, the halos around here, the black, all the different shadings uh, to bring out all the different contours. We then fit the crank to it. Uh, so we have a crank back here that tightens and vices on the, on the girl's head. The most difficult puppet to operate has got to be Timon. He's wearing it and he's operating it on different levels with his hands and uh, with his mouth as well. So it really is a, a difficult, difficult one to master. It's a joy to watch. You're never quite sure what to look at. I think one of our diff most difficult characters to, to animate, I think, is our bird is a zoo. It's one of our principal characters also. The material of the zoo is also like carbon 
for the beak and for the body. And then a lot of feathers that we cut each by each, which is also quite a lot of work um, to cover it. And um, then there's a, a mechanics where he can uh, open and close the beak and to animate the eyes. And then there's another handle for the wings. And uh, all in combination makes a really lovely puppet but it's really hard work for the character. <laughs> the actor's dressed in blue to represent the sky, and so he's able to, even though he is Zazu, the two of them together create Zazu. You see the beautiful flight of this, of this small puppet, yet you're able to see the actor as well in his expressions. So Zazu is a bird who also is holding a bird, a double event. You see the actor playing it, and that, and that costume represents, I think, um, the, the biggest idea in The Lion King that you could wear a human costume, a little bowler hat, what have you, and look like a human, look like an animal, represent some element of Africa, and still also represent the fusion, if you will, between Africa and the Englishness of that character. Well, even Mufasa's mask, it looks like a beautiful sunrise. The strength and, and of this beautiful oak on his head is carried through in his entire body and his persona. And that is the complete opposite of Scar. Scar's mask is all cut with different lines. Everything is askew, everything is angular. It's such a great opposite to who Mufasa is. You know, they're just pieces of art by themselves. And the technique of fabricating them and creating them and making them move, all of that is just an extraordinary feat of sort of theatrical magic. With all the theatrical elements in place to make this show unlike anything seen on stage before, once the theater maker's work is done, the rest of the show's success is out of their hands. When the audience walks out, I'm hoping they're thinking a few things. First, I hope that the story of The Lion King, about a young man who makes a mistake, believes he's done something terrible, decides to face his responsibility and go home to his community and set things right. I hope that resonates with them. I hope it also resonates with them, the thematic that we are all joined in, in this, if you will, circle of life that we sing about in the show that each of us are interconnected and relate to each other. That's hugely important to me, that you realize that not only do you share this experience with an audience in a live theater setting, but we all share this planet together, and The Lion King has a lot to say about that. And now, 10 years after its triumphant West End opening, The Lion King continues to enthrall audiences of all ages from around the world.